Oh, man. So good to be here. Um, Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we are so thankful for your goodness. There is no one like you, God. Your ways are much higher than ours, God. Lord, help us to see that. Help us to understand that. Lord, help us to live that. That your ways are always better than ours. And Lord God, uh, we exalt you. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who sees. And that, Lord, it can frighten us, Lord, that you can see every area of our life. But at the same time, you understand us. You have grace for us. You have mercy for us. You have power for us to live for you. Lord, help us to have that same mindset as we go through your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. If you could turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And before I even get into this passage, I I really do want to kind of give a almost an introduction, understanding that the book of Corinthians really, it's, it's this first Corinthians, it is church gone wild. There's so many, cha- all these chapters are dealing with issues within the church. But guess what? Nearly 2,000 years later, it's still, these are issues that are going on in the church. It's so important to understand that God's heart, God's heart isn't to point, just point out the wrong That isn't God's heart. That's like stating the obvious. That's like saying, oh, the walls are white, you know? It's like paint dries at a certain rate. I mean, state, sorry, Paul, I had to do a paint reference. How many years you've been doing paint? 40, is that all? We're not going to talk about how many gallons. Um, So the truth is, it's just stating, stating the obvious here. That God isn't just stating what's wrong. He's telling you this is the right way. You can, he's telling us, hey, there's a better way. There's a, there's a design that comes from God himself. This scripture here isn't even in your bulletin, but I'm going to read it for you because I think it's very apropos. In 2 second, uh, Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity iniquity is a fancy word for basically anything that's morally reprehensible or offensive to God. Okay. Now, in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, and some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. You guys want to you you, you be useful to the master, right? You want to be ready and available. You want to be sharp for Christ. So here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, As many of you probably know, these first two verses, you're going to read these first two verses of of chapter 7, were not originally written as chapter 7. There were no chapters in the Bible about 1,400 years ago after they were written. Until, you know, 1,400 years are going to go by, and there were no chapters in the Bible, okay? So it's important for us to understand that the first two verses of chapter 7, Paul is finishing chapter 6, with something that's actually relevant to it, which I will read. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own what? His own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Notice the, the emphatic there. It isn't saying it might be the temple of the Holy Spirit. No, it is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from who? God. And you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore. And by the way, that, that price was the precious blood of Christ. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Then we go on to verse 1 in chapter 7. Now concerning the things which you wrote to me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. 
Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own husband. Now, just to let you know, you know, Paul here in verse 1, he's saying he's responding to a concern that the Corinthian church had. But look at verse 1. In what way is the Apostle Paul stating that a man should not touch a woman? In what way? I mean, was it a simple touch? Jesus himself touched a woman and healed her. We're even instructed five times in the word that we should give each other a, a, a holy kiss. Not that I'm really into that. Not, you know. I don't know. Can I do a headbutt afterward? I don't know. Um, just the guys, okay? Um, even Jesus instructed his disciples to lay hands on people to heal them. So, so what is Paul saying here in verse 1? Well, if you look at the context of verse 2, we can understand that Paul is talking, talking to believers regarding, regarding the appropriate touching of a person. And, and it's talking about intimacy, sexual intimacy, who is touching a woman who's not their wife. Now, the culture of hedonism and lack of commitment to marriage was, was no less a danger even to the Christian church at Corinth. It's a danger to the church right now, right, right now in America, around the world. Hedonism, hedonism is basically the idea that sinful pleasure is the goal. It's what you want. And so we have this constant pressure from the world to accept that, that sexual immorality is just fine. It's, it's all natural. It's all good. And it's even encouraged among those who are either married towards un infidelity or it's even encouraged in the unmarried or young adults or even children today. Shocking. A lot of national surveys show that many couples are living together rather than being married. This includes people who identify themselves as Christian. They even go to church. And they think it's perfectly fine for them to live with someone who is not really their wife or their husband. This ends up literally creating millions of broken relationships, abortion, children being born outside of a stable marriage. Which I want to tell you that there's no, there's no illegitimate children. There's just illegitimate relationships. The children are quite legitimate. Many of them might not even know who their father is which is a huge crisis across the country right now. So many children don't even know who their dads are or their dads aren't even engaged in their life. Hey, guys, I want to tell you, step up. If you're a dad, step up. Continue to step up. Don't allow your kids to wander away from you. Be the dad they need to be, that you need to be for Christ. And it makes it so difficult for the church to have any clear moral examples or authority in our society when itself has forgotten to be obedient to the Lord, rather than instead of being, uh, following this popular culture around us. Jesus said that whatever, whatever is highly esteemed in the eyes of men is an abomination to God. I think that should give us like a clue where God is going with this. What is the world lifting up right now? What is the world celebrating right now? So how do we lift, and how do we lift up the sanctity of marriage? I mean, we all got on our little soapbox and said, oh, yeah, sanctity of marriage, yeah. And, and we're, we think just getting a divorce anytime we please or just, man, having relationships outside of marriage. How do, how do, we, how do we identify as believers when we have such moral compromise? We're providing a terrible example to the world what a godly marriage looks like. Sometimes I'll be talking to a cashier, and I don't know how I get on the subject. You know, it's the subject whether they like it or not, you know. Um, and I'll say, yeah, my wife and I, we've been married 45 years. And they go, what? <laughs> how does that happen? <laughs> and when they ask, I tell them, hey, it's all about the Lord. The Lord has kept, he is the glue that holds our marriage together. But honestly, for believers to live compromised life where they have sex before marriage or they, they have, they're in, 
they're unfaithful to their spouse. This creates moral and spiritual confusion in the world. In fact, you're emboldening people to continue to sin. If you're living that life, they're going, well, he does that. That's okay. It must be okay. He can still go to church and he can still live like that. And so it produces moral and spiritual confusion. Instead of dying to themselves and honoring Christ in their relationships. 1 Corinthians 14.33. What is the verse here, guys? For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. We don't want to send a confusing message to the world. We want it to be loud and clear and loving and graceful and merciful and, and, and in, a, in a manner that people have no doubt. When they look at us, they go, well, <laughs> they're actually faithful to their spouse. They're at, Wow, that's interesting. Their young people are actually holy. They're holy like Daniel. They're holy like Josiah. They're holy. They, they are these holy children that are set apart for the Lord. Their eye is on the prize. They believe that Jesus Christ is the most important person in their life. They're not living religious lives. They're living for Jesus. And this gets even into the subject of Christians dating. And I know I'm going to step on a few toes here, but that's okay. Sometimes we need to get, God needs to get our attention. Is there such a thing that's even condoned in the Bible? Is it truly a godly way for the opposite sex to relate to one another? How can we avoid falling into the same trap of potential immorality? Perhaps we get a good example with Ruth and Boaz. Because they, in the Bible, it's interesting. Ruth was just a, she was a foreigner who came into the land with her mother-in-law. And, and Ruth made it really clear that, that she wanted, that the God of Israel, she wanted God to be her God. And she wanted to be with the people of Israel. And she, lived, she helped her, her mother-in-law. She served her mother-in-law. And, and the fact is, is, it's apparent that Ruth and Boaz just observed each other's lives from a distance without giving in to mere attraction. I'm going to repeat that. They observed the other person's life without even giving in. You can be attracted to someone. You're a single person. You're attracted to someone. And you think they're a wonderful human being. You, you've been around them a little bit. And you go, wow, they're really intriguing. And I like the way they laugh. And I, I love their personality. You know, There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay. You admire that a, that a mountain looks beautiful. You say, oh, she's beautiful. Or you say, that guy's handsome. Perfectly fine. But where do you take that? Where are you going to take those feelings? And what does it mean? But I would say that... that Dating, the problem with dating is, is, it, is it circumvents the whole concept of courtship, of the seriousness of why do you have these feelings? These feelings of sexuality, they're not meant to be just spent upon the world. They are meant for an actual purpose in God's plan. There's an actual purpose in it. And so Ruth and Boaz, they observed each other from a distance. She observed that he was a awesome business owner. He was kind to the poor. He allowed people to glean the fields. He had a good reputation in the city. She observed this kind of lifestyle in this guy and realized he was a compassionate man, a hardworking man. He observed that she was compassionate as well. She was hardworking. She feared God. In like manner, like manner, I'm not telling you you can't be attracted to someone. It's natural to be attracted. But understand, what is the purpose behind it? To what goal do you want to be attracted? Why would you allow yourself to even fantasize when you're not even ready for marriage? You're not even ready for those, that very serious step. The world wants you to just, oh, try out everybody that you're interested in. I'm telling you, that is foolishness. That is a lie from, God, from, from Satan himself. God has called us to holiness. 
Oh, you, you didn't get that memo when you became a Christian. Oh, yeah, you're not decayed to your flesh. Because your flesh will tell you, well, whatever I want, I'm going to get. And I'm going, well, that's, I'm, that's not the Christian life. That's not the Christian life. So you choose, you choose. Choose between Christ and the way the world lives. I think it's great when young people get together with people of the opposite sex. They interact with each other. They have respectful, godly, kind relationships with each other. Perfectly fine. But guess what? You're brothers and sisters. So how should you relate to your brother or sister? Because anything more than that is, ew. Just saying. When you're ready, when, you know, Song of Solomon says, you, you don't awaken love. Don't be foolish. These are powerful urges, powerful forces. And you don't awaken those areas. You say, you say no to those things. You give it over to God and you, you just follow the Lord. Allow God to provide someone for you when you're really ready, when you're really supposed to get married. Do you ever notice that? It's, it's for marriage. There, there, I'm sorry, there's no other category. <clears throat> there is a foolishness in the world. And over time, Ruth and Boaz would get married. And obviously they loved each other. And by the way, from that lineage came Jesus himself. It's a beautiful thing. But they first got to know each other by observation, not all the trappings of intimacy before marriage. It's so important to be patient when looking for a spouse. First observe how they treat others, their family and church. If you're looking for a spouse, are they sold out to Christ? Or are they just religious? If they're just religious, please avoid them like a plague. Pray for them. Pray for their growth in Jesus. Do they love children? Man, that can be a huge indicator where they're at. Do they love to serve or be served? Are they in the word? Are they submitted to authority? Are they staying in fellowship? Are they accountable with other believers? All of these are important questions when you're observing the kind of person you're going to spend the rest of your life with. Because for the believer, divorce is, is hardly meant to be any kind of option. It really is not meant to be like, oh, this is our go-to if, if I become weak in the flesh and I decide to go somewhere else. Or if I just get tired of this person or I can't reconcile with this person. Or No, you, you fight for your marriage. You may not be aware of it, but I've had to fight for my marriage. Found out that Diane and I were human. Wow, we actually get mad at each other every so often. It's intense. And guess what? Jesus bids us to die. If we don't, guess what? There's no new life. If you die to yourself, there'll be new life in your, in your marriage. You have a new love for your spouse. I like the fact that I'm still in love with my wife. Still in love. Notice the assumption that Paul says here in verse 2 that any sexual intimacy outside of marriage is immoral before God. So what kind of sexual behavior is acceptable, appropriate before marriage? Once again, none. Let, let's be honest. To those of you who are single, is, it, is not a passionate kiss a prelude to something that could lead to inappropriate touching or giving away your virginity? Stating a fact, even producing a child without even, wow, producing a child without the stability of a marriage. When a Christian dating couple gives permission to touch in each other's bodies, are they not both leading each other into sin? And I'm going to tell you, that is, that's straight from the throne of God. I know that is God's heart. Is it truly loving and honoring to God to lead someone into sin? This is not a hard question. Is it loving and honoring to God to lead someone into sin? 
I hope under your breath you're saying, God forbid that I ever lead anyone into sin. So many times, couples will say that they really love each other, but isn't it, it isn't love to lead someone into sin. You'll be leading your brother or sister into serious sin. You're, you're etching away, you're digging, you're, you're destroying their relationship with God. I mean, what did Jesus say about the seriousness of leading others into sin? What did he say? You might as well just tie a millstone around your neck. I don't know. Is it too heavy? I don't know. It seems like a heavy thing. You might as well put a millstone around your neck and throw yourself in the sea. How is it prudent to be alone with someone you're attracted to who isn't your married, isn't your spouse? How is it? How is that prudent? And I'm telling you, married guys, you work somewhere and, and, and some co-worker of the opposite sex says, hey, why don't we go out for lunch? No, don't. Don't even go there. Don't even entertain the idea. I don't care how innocent it appears. Do not even do that. Don't, don't even bother. It's just foolish. How wise is it to go back to someone's apartment alone late at night? I mean, this is like a, an intelligence test on your own nature. I mean, an invitation to a nightcap ends up being a death cap to your relationship with God. There's a foolishness in this world, and it promotes it, and it says, oh, nothing will happen. Trust me, it will. We shouldn't be any part of what the world is pushing Decide once and for all to pursue holiness and respect in all your relationships. You protect. If you're, let's say that you're on the road to courtship. Let's say you, you know, this person, I'm going to, I'm, yeah, we're probably going to get married. We're really heading in that direction. You protect that person. You have a heart of protection for them. You protect their relationship with God. You protect their Morals. You protect their walk in Jesus. You look out for them. You care for them. The Bible tells us that real love does not, real agape love, unconditional love from God, does not rejoice in iniquity. And you know that iniquity is anything that is immoral. As you might know before... Sex before marriage is commonly known as fornication. In case you didn't know, that's a, one of those Bible words. And those who practice fornication, the Bible says, those who practice it will not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, if, if you don't at least love someone enough to not be immoral with them, at least understand your salvation is, is, is questionable here. You're, I'm questioning whether you even know God. If, you're, if you think that practicing sin on a regular basis is perfectly fine, I question whether you're saved. And I can say that with authority. I believe in internal security, but that's for people who are really saved. People who are really saved hate sin. They can't live in it very long at all. They can just, it, just, ah. it, just doesn't, it just doesn't make sense. And so, sometimes in those relationships, you'll show where you're really at in the Lord, too. I mean, do you really want to give up your relationship with God for a feeling? I mean, it's such a beautiful thing when two people are faithful to each other, even before marriage. It just portends what's going to be happening in the future. There's going to be a huge faithfulness. Huge faithfulness. And by the way, there's no regret in being holy. 1 Corinthians 7.32 says, But I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for what? How many girls he can take out? No, oh, that's really funny. In the Greek, it just says, They're caring for the things of the Lord. How he may please the Lord. If you're single, that should be your passion. That should be your driving force in your mind. That should be like 
I mean, there shouldn't be any distraction. And by the way, if your potential spouse or your potential girlfriend or your potential boyfriend doesn't love Jesus more than you, you shouldn't, you don't even bother being with that person. Their, their priorities are all messed up. By the way, you should have that same heart too. If, if you should love Jesus more than anything else in this world, and that includes all your relationships. A person that doesn't love Jesus more than you. I know that my wife loves Jesus more than me. I like that. You're going, whoa, whoa. don't you want to be loved more than even Jesus? No. And it's going to, and it really literally will affect the way she lives her life in our home. If she loves Jesus more than me. If she loves Jesus more than me, then she will sacrifice for Jesus. She will serve as unto the Lord. She will love with God's love. Amen. And we don't, we just don't, we really don't want to be around someone that's immature like that. Don't think, well, eventually they'll grow in the Lord. Eventually they'll grow in the, we'll get married and eventually they'll grow in the Lord. Stop. And I will admit, it's a miracle. I I'll be honest with you, I was completely clueless how th this, this guy was close to cartel level. <sighs> but by the grace of God. 1 Corinthians 7.34, the unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord. That she may be what? Holy both in body and spirit. Notice the focus here. It isn't how many boyfriends can I get on my belt? How many, how, many, how many people can I talk to about my wild love life? No, it's about a believer. It's such a beautiful thing. When I meet godly women, young women, it's just so sweet. It's so awesome. We have a number of those in this church. I know their, their focus is Jesus. They're not distracted. 1 uh, Timothy 4, 12. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, till I come. Give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Notice this. Be an example to the believers in word. You young people. I don't despise your youth. I expect great things from you. I believe great things because we serve a great God. Right? God can do so much through you. God was able to do so much in the young, even in, in the Bible. You can see that. Of course, you got Jesus at 12 years old kind of instructing the leaders. I mean, that's, that's kind of cool. You can do the same. If you're, if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you're in the Word of God all the time, you'd be, you'd be surprised. We'll, we'll, we'll plant you in this church. We, we don't discriminate based on age. We, we want just mature believers. If you're a mature believer, I, I knew a guy that was maybe 16, he became a pastor. And he, cause he, and he, could, teach me, he could teach me around corn. I mean, he was an amazing teacher. The idea is, is, that, is that God God wants you as a young person to be an example to others. Do you know, did you ever notice that, that, you know, we always talk about, well, you know, the young are looking at the older people and, you know, what kind of example are the older people doing? Well, that's true. It's absolutely true. You older people, guess what? You need to be a godly example at all times. If you're not, you need to repent. For the sake of the young, for the sake of the next generation, for the sake of the glory of God. But you young people understand you are an example to other young people. Something about that peer pressure, something about that, you know. I mean, you all do things together. So where do you want to, where do you want to drive other people? Do you want to drive people? Do you want to drive other young people to the arms of Jesus or do you want to drive them to the world? Do you want to be an example, a godly example? And that requires a disciplined Christian life. And if it's drudgery to you, then you need to actually get your, right, get your heart right with God. 
Because it should be a passion in your heart to lead others to Christ and to keep leading your fellow brothers and sisters, younger brothers and sisters, to the Lord. That should be your mission in this life right now and always. Now, sexual desire was not created by God just for procreation. It's also to create greater emotional and spiritual connection with the one we're to be married. Not something to be expressed outside of marriage. And who wants to carry the baggage of multiple sexual relationships into the marriage that God actually wants for us? I mean, is that even fair to the spouse that you're going to eventually marry? Do you want all kinds of baggage? Girlfriends, boyfriends, often. Do you really want that? It's a lot of regret, right? I want to stop right there, though. I want to tell you that I'm not telling this to your shame. I'm admonishing you. I'm warning you. I'm imploring you to live godly for the sake, for your sake of your own soul and for the sake of even souls in our church and in the community. And there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. Right now, if you're involved in some kind of sexual immorality, you know it's not right. Hey, Jesus isn't going, oh, I've never even heard of that. Come on. Jesus died for every sin. There is forgiveness for all sin. But it does require that you come to your senses and go, I'm sinning. I'm really messing up right now. Getting on your face before God. Literally getting on your face before God and saying, I am so sorry, God. Give me strength. Help me to find a, a brother in the Lord. Help me to find a sister in the Lord. Obviously, guys with guys, gals with gals. But be appropriate and just say, look, pray for me. I'm struggling in this area of my life. Please pray for me. And you'll be surprised. The other person will go, well, I'm kind of struggling myself. So let's pray for each other. Let's hold each other accountable. Let's pray for each other. Let's, let's text each other during the week. Let's keep pushing ourselves towards Jesus instead of allowing our flesh to, to circumvent our relationship with the Lord. Your spouse, your future spouse, should be your only one. It's not like you're, you know, people say you're trying out a new car. Oh, please. That's just, that's so crass. It's just so gross. My wife is my only one. You ever seen that in, my arm is shaking, that's weird. I hear that elderliness is going around. You ever seen that in a, like a TV program where you're watching and some guy, some guy walks up to a gal and he's, he's closer and he's really supposed to be? You ever seen that? And I, it makes me feel like, ah, oh, that's really awkward. And, and I'm surprised she's not going, uh, step away, a little distance here, buddy, right? And it's that sense of, of, of that that you're, you, you want to have, you want to have real boundaries in your life. You want to have real accommodate. In other words, my, my, my wife is my only one. So if a woman came up to me really close, I'm like, excuse me, <laughs> a little bit of space here, you know. It's interesting to note that Adam lived 930 years, and he only had one spouse. I think he got the whole screw the cap on the, on the toothpaste thing. He, yeah. He was an expert by then. He had like a whole library of, oh yeah, this is how she likes her food, and this is, you know. He became an expert, which by the way, guys, if you're, if you're married, be an expert on your wife. Really, observe her. Observe what, don't be like the guy that, oh, I'm just coming in the house and I don't see anything. I'm just doing my own thing. And Stop. Observe your wife. Okay, observe. How does she like things? How does she see things? I'm still learning that, by the way. I'm no expert. But there's some things I can, you know, that I, I definitely know now. Oh, wow, okay. You know. Observe. 
You know, Jesus reaffirmed this notion by defining marriage as between one male and one female. I know, it's real, real revelation, right? God designed that there would be a male and a female. Genesis 2.18, God said, It is not good for a man that, that he should be alone. I will make a helper com comparable to him. Now, the word comparable there, it's interesting. It means a counterpart. It means an opposite. It means they correspond to each other. Literally, they fit together. You'll notice that God's original design was a joining of one male and one female. No other variation was offered, by the way, at that time. It wasn't like God said, oh, there's you know, a, a male and a female for you, Adam. No, he didn't do that. Notice it was just one female. And this was God's design. So how, who wants to go by God's design? I, you know, I mean, come on. We want to go by God's design. Malachi, look at this, God's design in Malachi 2.13. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying, so that he does not regard the offering anymore, but receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, with whom you have dealt treacherously, yet she is your companion. And your wife by covenant, very strong word there, but did he not make them one, having a remnant of the Spirit? And why one? He seeks, why are they one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. For the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you not, do not deal treacherously. <clears throat> That's a very telling scripture, by the way. It is amazing. There is, a, there is a goal in mind here, this oneness. Raising godly, godly offspring. And God himself, the Lord God himself is saying, don't you deal with your wife treacherously. Don't go doing stuff behind her back. Marriage was meant to be a lifelong relationship of trust and respect. It's a picture of the church itself and Christ. Your marriage is to look like that. The book of Proverbs also gives us an admonition regarding being faithful to one spouse. Proverbs 5.15 Drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breasts satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you say, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? This isn't just being with someone physically. This is being with someone mentally as well. If you're fantasizing, if you're married, if you're fantasizing about another woman other than your wife, that's adultery. It's not right. If you're involved in pornography, that's adultery. In verse 3 of our passage today, chapter 7, Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. And, let the, wi and the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except for consent, with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that you may give yourself, uh, so that, oh, I'm sorry. Um, do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. And come together again so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But... But I say this as a concession, not as a commandment. 
Now, according to verse 3 here, the husband's to render to the wife due affection. And there are more ways affection isn't always sexual. It can be many other things. You need to know what kind of things really are just a blessing to your wife. Sometimes an act of service. Sometimes giving her gifts. Taking her out for dinner. I hope you guys are, I hope you married guys are taking your wife out on regular dates. If that ain't happening, you need to change your schedule, okay? I got to admit, it was kind of a game changer for my wife and I when we decided to like switch with, with a couple. <clears throat> and every other week, we, at least, we were going out together. <clears throat> it was good. They could watch our kids. We could watch their kids. It was a really great setup. So important to spend time to each other. What? What are you guys talking about? We want to make sure you explain switching with a couple. <laughs> switching babysitters. Yes. Switching babysitters. Yes. You followed up. You're good. In the Greek, that means switching babysitters. <laughs> wow. Is my face red? Oh, my word. On to the teaching. Bye, look at the time. Oh, my goodness. Hey, even putting the toilet seat down is a big deal, you know? Little things, little things. If you're, it's the little things that speak love to your wife. It's the little things that speak love to your husband, okay? And of course, there's a there's a sense of mutual acceptance, respect, and love towards each other, towards each other's needs. If the two truly be one, then both and equally the couple should enjoy love and intimacy. It's not exclusive to either male or female. We should always remember that that. We're not our own. We are bought with a price. We're to glorify God in our body. A part of glorifying God in our body is actually loving our wives, loving our husband, right? Paul makes it clear not to deprive our spouses of sexual intimacy unless you both agree to do so. Um, and you should never, never use that, that intimacy as a weapon, okay? You're upset with them. Now, you do need to get the relationship right, okay? But never use it as something to manipulate. That's just, it's ungodly. It's unkind. <clears throat> but notice Paul also says many of these things are way of instruction and concession. Not because he wants to lord it over their marriages. Though these, these instructions make so much sense, right? Ultimately, Paul desires that married couples have a genuine concern for each other and love and, and tenderness towards each other. Guys, you've got to be gentle with your wives. Be gentle. Be kind. Be gracious. Be sensitive. Okay? It's a manly thing to be sensitive, by the way. It's manly. Manly men aren't a bunch of doofuses. I mean, we were, my wife and I were, were talking about how two guys were talking to each other, and, and they really weren't saying anything. The guy was saying, well, I, I, I just, uh, yeah. and the guy goes, yeah, I know what you mean. And, you know, it's like this back and forth. They didn't really explain what they were even talking about. And I was going, this is a perfect example of how guys communicate with each other. It's all this assumed stuff without really explaining it. And, and guys, we've we got to step up our game on, on communication, which is always a struggle for myself as well. So God designed marriage to be a picture of faithfulness and even the glory of God. But if we move away from God's design from the very beginning, we're dating out of Christ, I'm not dating in Christ. Dating in Christ means that you would only date someone that you're actually serious about because God has actually moved you into a place in your life when you believe that you're supposed to be getting married sometime in the near future. If, if you're in that, that, great, fine, it's fine, you know. But understand the gravity of what you're doing. Understand, put it limitations on your life. Refuse to be with that person alone in their apartment, refuse to, to be alone in the car with them. It's stupid. It's just plain stupid. 
Anybody want to argue with that, talk to me after the service. I will tell you how stupid it could really get. And it's just sad because we hear the stories. As pastors, we hear the stories of, you know, people having children out of wedlock. We hear about broken hearts. We hear about all of it. And you yourselves know, you, even from experience, many of you could probably speak better than I could. But, but God's design, if we follow God's design, are not God's ways better than ours? And God has called us to holiness and not to draw the rest of the world into confusion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your, your goodness. We thank you, God, that you've offered us nothing. As a good father, you've offered us the, the only way. It is the better way. It is the best way. Lord, to avoid heartache, to avoid confusion, to avoid immorality, anything that would dishonor you. God, we just ask that you would be Lord over every area of our life. Lord, if we're not, please, Lord, give us, help us to repent, Lord, of, of foolishness in our hearts. Lord, we end up arguing against you, which is just foolish. Lord, we know better. <laughs> we don't. Your ways are so much higher. Lord, we want to be obedient to you. And Lord, if our relationship with you is not right, Lord, why would we draw someone else into that same poor relationship with you? Lord, help us to first focus on our relationship with you and allow you to provide. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for this flock. In Jesus' name, amen.